Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I know some of you are in Buffalo and some of you are uh, tuning in from much further away. So welcome and I look forward to the next hour. I'll keep this short. I'm delighted to uh, be able to introduce at home tonight and to be to have the, the great fortune of being able to show his work uh, in the exhibition. So the work can be seen at Anderson Gallery on the second floor. So I would really invite you all to, if you haven't seen the work yet, to get over there and uh, experience it for yourself. Um, Adam Faramoy is an artist based in London. Their work spans media, including moving image, sculptural installation and print, thinking through issues of materiality, touch and toxic embodiment to question ideas of the natural in relation to marginalized communities. They lecture at both Goldsmith University in London and the Ruskin School of Art in Oxford. Faramoui's work has been exhibited in solo exhibitions at the Blue Coat in Liverpool and Nehru Ratman, Ratnam Gallery in London and a group exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery, Somerset House, and Serpentine Gallery in London. In 2018, they presented a show on the body and VR for BBC Radio 4. In 2019, they premiered their video piece, Skin Flick, at the screening at uh, Tate Britain dedicated to their work. In 2022, they performed their first live work as part of the Serpentile Ecologies Program, Back to Earth. They were shortlisted for the Jarman Award in both 2017 and 2021. Um, welcome, Adam, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Sylvie. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Adam Foramawi. My pronouns are they, them. Um, thanks so much for having me here today. It was uh, really exciting, actually, to be in Buffalo recently because my work's included in the current exhibition at the University Galleries and because I got to meet some of you for, our convers uh, for conversations in your studios. Um, I am talking from my home in London tonight, and it's very late here, um, so please forgive any fogginess on my part, and to give a bit of a warning that my talk deals with one or two difficult uh, experiences and events. Um, I wanted to start my talk tonight by extending my condolences to the victims and families of the recent attack at the Q-Bar in Colorado Springs. My thoughts and my heart are with those grieving tonight. Um, America can be a strange place uh, and as a migrant and a North African Arab it feels like I need to address that whenever I work there. You know so much of the news about events there just really terrifies me and I say this to highlight the historical relationship between England and, and America and also what's been going on in Britain of late. Um, America's a country, it's a political territory uh, founded on invasion and colonization and built and developed through the displacement of its indigenous peoples and exploitation of enslaved African labor. Um, and also the historic and continuing unsustainable extraction of natural resources prioritizing profit over environment and over life, not to mention the effects its political and military decisions have on the lives of people internationally. And for me, this needs stating just over and over again. And it's against this backdrop of inequality that I'm speaking here today. Uh, I'm an artist. Um, I, I've worked across a very wide variety of medias as a Sylvie said, I've made computer programs, I've made an app, perfume and prints, but most of my work revolves around performance for camera videos, often installed as part of sculptural assemblages. And in the last few years, I've been making video works that move between biological or etymological history, so between biology and language, um, to more personal histories or fictions, to try to find context for myself, to make a bit of space to breathe and to think and to consider the ways that I've been able to navigate or, or move through the world. Uh, my research centers the body. Uh, I like this idea of the body as a starting point, uh, a place to begin and performance and movement feel like a really direct way to 
instigate discourses and discussion around bodies and lived experience. I've drawn on ideas and images of porous bodies in science fiction to explore how different species get tangled up in each other's lives, like describing the different relationships that people have had with, say, a flower, um, how it's named, thought of and used to examine stories of migration and interrogate my own desires, thinking through the different ways that a body, a behavior, a movement or, or an interaction might be desirable and when it or they might be unwelcome. Um, in 2019, I made a video work called Skin Flick, which as Sylvie mentioned, premiered at a screening dedicated to my work at Tate Britain in London, which I later developed into a series of sculptural iterations the first of these was installed at the Science Gallery also in London, then a different iteration was developed for the group show I Don't Know You Like That, The Bodywork of Hospitality, first at the Bemis Centre in Nebraska and now at the Anderson Gallery in Buffalo. And I'm just going to share my screen so that I can show you some videos and some images. You might um, recognise some of your student colleagues in this image over here. <laughs> um, skin flick marked a shift in the practice. It's a uh, personal work and making this video was a way for me to explore my experiences of intimacy and desire as a queer migrant body living in a European country with a colonial history that really shapes its present situation. Um, being a body is complicated and the work is so much about tracing this tangle of experiences and events, some of which contradict each other. I guess the work ended up exploring or, or butting up against some of the complexity of my own experience living in the UK at a sensitive political moment of redressing racial tensions, leaving the EU and the crackdown on political borders and boundaries. And the phrase skin flick was, I mean, it was meant to be offered with a lightness of touch and with some humor. You know, the skin flick as pornographic movie, the flick of the skin as a sensual gesture and sensation, using ointments and bodily fluids and Pepsi and soil and toxins and contaminants to test the body's boundaries as a site of the political, you know, as a border, uh, as a margin, as a point of interface. And I drew a lot from well, I mean, actually a lot of very different places to produce this work, you know, personal anecdotes and experiences, mythology, uh, the taxonomy and migration stories of plants and other non-human life. Um, and actually earlier in the summer, I received a very lovely essay, including thoughts on skin flick by an American author and scholar called Sophie Lewis, mostly focusing on the role of the mythological figure of Daphne and her metamorphosis into a laurel tree where the video is described in their words as an ecosexual porno movie. If we understand Eros in terms of liveliness, a state teeming with life, then we can perhaps summarize the buried crux of the metamorphosis as, followed, as follows. It is the moment when a bombshell desires not to be beautiful and becomes quasi accidentally hot. I think that this is actually quite a wonderful reading, partly for the use of the word bombshell to describe Daphne, because I think that's incredible. Uh, and partly because it reminds me of that short nature series where Isabella Rossellini, uh, dressed in cardboard costume, dramatizes the sex life of snails. And more directly, I enjoyed this description because I wanted to share an image of the body as something beyond beauty as commodity, you know? I, I, it feels like it makes space to question hotness, desire and belonging. It, may, it makes some space to question what it is to be a body in relation to other bodies. And actually after the talks at the opening event at the Anderson Gallery, um, someone from the medical research department in Buffalo asked me a question about the installation. We got to talking about the intersection of race and gender and sexuality and about how so much of my experience of these, um, I guess, classifiers is as a negotiation, as something that exists in relation to something else. And 
can't necessarily stand by itself. It doesn't really need to exist by itself. And by extension, thinking about limits and boundaries and what constitutes them you know do our bodies really end at the skin or do we extend out into our environments through bacteria and through touch and this idea or or image or way of thinking about the body is you know as, as something more porous particularly in relation to intimacy became more important during the pandemic and the overlaps between language that deals with biology and language that describes cultural values seems to have become even more entangled and sticky. You know, how do we, uh, sorry, how we describe something can and does have real world implications and effects. And actually this image of the porosity of the body is heavily indebted to the iconic sci-fi author Octavia Butler's third gender characters, the Uloi uh, from Lilith's Brood. And Lilith Brood describes characters, mainly the African-American protagonist Lilith, named after the biblical first wife of Adam and the mother of monsters, waking in an unfamiliar world, uh, forced to come to terms with unexpected biological processes caused by a forced integration with an alien race after an apocalyptic earth shattering war. So essentially the, the alien Owen Carly wants to procreate and become hybrid with humans through a third gendered mate, the Uloi, who would join a male female couple, extending these fine tendrils into both partners' bodies, tasting them through the mycelia, simultaneously healing them at a cellular level and generating and enjoying a pleasurable coital hallucination. And this series of books was really important for me. You know, they, they kind of got me through the healing process after a road accident I had where my body behaved in some unexpected and sometimes disgusting ways. But also it was incredibly useful to read Butler using this story to think about issues of gender and consent, to think about the transatlantic slave trade and its legacies, and also to propose a relationship between a toxic hierarchical masculinity and our approach to ecology. You know, I found something so profoundly queer and nourishing in the image of a non-binary fungal sexuality. And it's been a foundational image for me. You know, as I say in the video, I wish my desires were more vegetal. Okay, so I'm just gonna end sharing. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, skin flick marked a shift for me. You know, I wanted to explore my own experiences by figuring out how to describe things, you know, by telling stories in my own voice. So I started scripting for the videos, uh, which I always planned to be both part of sculptural assemblages, as you've seen, uh, you know, a bodily and material viewing experience and a durational viewing experience that would be watched from start to finish in say a cinema or as a single channel projection. And this meant that text and textual reference started playing a bigger part in how I made my work. You know, I've always enjoyed reading sci-fi and poetry and comics and some theory, but actually I've, I've maybe got a certain level of animosity when it comes to reading more academic writing. You know, I, I get a little bit suspicious um, for me, theory needs to maintain a direct relationship with lived experience uh, and provide tools for navigating real world events or problems, or I find myself veering away from it. And having said that, I drew really very heavily on the work of Catriona Sandilands, the, the academic that coined the term queer ecologies, uh, particularly her talk, Botanically Queer. I enjoyed the work of Astrida Nimanis. Uh, I, I very much liked uh, composting feminisms. Uh, poet Marwa Halel's book, Invasive Species, and Nishara Maya's States of the Body Produced by Love. And both uh, Nishara Maya and Marwa Halel's anthologies shared writing that offered me ways of thinking through my cultural and bodily experiences, and also shared some thoughts on how culture and ideology can manifest materially in some inexplicably violent ways. Um, in one poem, Marwa Halel, who is Egyptian American, describes the visa application process in the American embassy in Cairo 
while she's trying to apply for American citizenship to rejoin her family in the States, which was an experience of the absurdity and the violence of both American and Egyptian bureaucratic processes that I recognize, naturally English bureaucratic processes also. Um, the, the, the poem echoed my own experiences of the difficulty of traveling across political borders, you know, of simply moving between one place and another as an Arab, particularly within Europe or to America, but also my experiences verifying my status for Egyptian military conscription, which to be frank was humiliating and terrifying in equal measure. Um, Hillel also included multiple texts on different species that found their ways to North America, uh, like the common carp in Illinois, um, and how they affect ecosystems there. So I kept going back to this writing and this way of processing bureaucracy through metaphor, and it helped me through. You know, it was something to do with positioning yourself in relation to. Uh, and I'm not sure that I can totally unpack that because in a way it's as simple as that, you know, how you sit in relation to other people and to stories, to histories, how you find a precedent for yourself and your experiences. Um, I recognize some of my own experiences as a migrant in Britain in some of Banu Kapil's writing also, um, particularly the book, How to Wash a Heart, which in talking about the social politics of hosting and being a guest, in being somewhere that you don't necessarily belong, offered me these rare and really quite sublime moments of recognition where you see yourself in the text. Um, language for me has been a way to map out the space between experience and mediation, between the thing and its description, you know? Um, language is slippery. It's a site of slippage and instability. And instability is really important, you know, it's useful. It provides that little bit of space to ask questions about ways of being, ways of moving through the world that, that are understood as natural when actually they could or should be understood as cultural, you know, as a choice. Um, and actually animation has been another way for me to question or to prod the stability of the image and so the stability of coding a body, uh, looking at how we, we answer the question, what is that? You know, um, I've worked a lot with animation and virtual effects. Uh, in the last few years, it's become useful to animate some of the plants that feature in the work, as well as insects and fungi and mold. Um, I tend to subscribe to this idea of animation as, as a macabre practice, uh, kind of thinking about animating the non-living, uh, copying, simulating, pretending to be alive. Uh, the cartoon is a kind of zombie. Um, animating some plants while filming others has been quite an interesting exercise in denaturalizing. Uh, I want for us to be able to look closely at the ways these plants live and cohabit and romance. In Botanically Queer, Catriona Sandilands talks really candidly about the ways that plants and other species reproductive practices don't adhere to human social and sexual norms and how looking more closely at, at some of the other species that we share the planet with can serve to denaturalize some of our own thinking and social expectations around sex and gender, which are so central to my concerns in skin flip. This is where stuff changes. <laughs> in the summer of 2020, uh, I started work on a piece titled The Air is Subtle, Various and Sweet, which I shot with two dancers in the Wanstead Flats Nature Reserve near my home in East London. Um, then while I was developing it, I was invited to participate in an online symposium for Serpentine Ecologies about soil. Uh, and that was titled The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish the understory of the understory. And so I made a preliminary version of the work which privileged audio uh, with the understanding that I would further develop the video and then produce a sculptural iteration of the work. Um, the Eris Subtle was a challenging work to make, to say the least. Uh, 2020 was a chaotic year for many of us in a variety of ways and it's really hard to talk about this video outside of the circumstances that produced it. Um, 
like for almost everyone, the pandemic sharpened some of the pressures in my life. Uh, when lockdown hit, most of my work was postponed or cancelled. My flatmate moved out immediately, so I ended up spending most of the year without human contact. Um, I got into some very public racialized fights with institutions that I've worked with, not least for my, my teaching work at university, which pays my bills. Um, and this was at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, which led to a lot of institutions asking me to work on public facing statements on racism for free, most of which haven't been followed up on since. And during all of this, my father passed away. I wasn't able to go to his funeral in Egypt. Uh, and actually I, uh, I watched an online wake some of his friends and colleagues streamed on YouTube, which I sat through after a very long and racist meeting for a charity that I'd been working for. So actually in a lot of ways, this video became central to my grieving process. Um, it was a way for me to think through my complex relationship with my father by considering our different relationships to land and to place. Um, he was an artist. He was a, a political cartoonist for 40 years. Uh, he was a musician. He wrote plays, he acted. He presented a couple of TV shows, one of which I use in the video. Um, he was conscripted to the Egyptian army. And as I mentioned, I wasn't. He drove a tank for a while. He was a, a history teacher after university for, a, for quite a few years actually. And, um, so it was an interesting character and very much uh, a performer. Um, and through all of his public work, he, he really foregrounded his falahi, meaning working class, rural roots and upbringing. It was, um, it was really important to him to champion that part of himself. He was, as far as I know, the first person to go to university in his family. His parents, my paternal grandparents were illiterate. And though our relationship was complicated, this aspect of his character especially was something that I treasured, you know? My parents' socialism and social awareness have shaped the ways that I navigate my life living in England. So I'm just gonna show another work. I'm gonna show the air is subtle. Hopefully that video is, is um, visible now. The Air is Subtle, Various and Sweet is actually a quote from an Ursula Le Guin sci-fi novel, The Word for World is Forest. Um, that novel was a breath of fresh air in a very rough moment and encouraged me to look closer at the plants around me. So I'm just gonna fast forward this. Um, so for example, I, I looked at the Scotch broom, which in the video introduces this really bodily narrative through its medicinal uses, which are associated with blood. And also, and this is actually true of many of the plants in the work, their colonial histories through migratory patterns and esoteric or, or folkloric associations and also gender oppression in, in thinking about how the Scotch broom was burned to stop witches in Italy. Also, I filmed a marshmallow plant at the edge of a car park by the roadside leading into the flats. And the research really surprised me because in looking at the etymology of its Latin name, which is uh, Malva parviflora, it, I guess it shifts relations with the body. It, it reveals associations with softness and softening, uh, rottenness, putrefaction and slime. Uh, and also in cooking, how it can be used to make this thick mucusy broth, which reminded me a lot of Egyptian foods like okra or molochia, which are both delicious, but can also be pretty slimy. Um, but also this section of the film serves to draw us backwards historically in discovering the marshmallows uses as an aphrodisiac in ancient Greece. And also that in, uh, then ancient Egypt sat from the roots of the common mallow would be uh, served with honey as a sweet. And so it kind of behaves as a narrative transition, leading us from East London to Egypt via these ancient Egyptian confections. The marshmallow in the car park segues us into a dream about my dad's flat. Um, and I'll show you that now. Um, my dad lived in 
his hometown, uh, which is called Tuch. Um, and this is a real dream I had, but in the video, it introduces him and our relationship, but also his relationship to material and to history and to human touch, uh, which leads into a segment of a television show my dad presented called My Relationship with a Place, where he tours uh, his neighborhood describing where he grew up and the conditions that he lived in and how he started drawing on the walls of, his, uh, of the neighbor's houses using charcoal from the local bakery, slipping from this warm but factual description into poetry where he uses this really rich and idiosyncratic language. And this was one of the ways that my dad foregrounded his heritage, you know, it was in his use of language. Traditionally, poetry might be written in classical Arabic, but here he not only speaks colloquially, but he mixes formal sentence structures with a very rich local voc uh, vocabulary. Translating his words was a labor of love, really. Uh, I didn't feel like I could ask someone outside the family to work on it. So I actually asked my sister to do the translation with me. Um, my language isn't anywhere near strong enough for translation. And I didn't feel like I could send this material to a translator that I didn't know. My weak vocabulary in Arabic has always felt like a bit of a barrier for me, but my sister is a journalist and a translator like my mum. So, we were able to work on this together and her proximity, her closeness to the material, you know, to our dad's words felt so direct and it was really good to do this together. We actually ended up working on a fair bit of the research together um, and my mum ended up doing a bit of the copy editing. Um, my dad's relationship to heritage felt so certain and so stable in a lot of ways. In the video, it's framed very much through class struggle and that his education and his art, whether in drawing satirical cartoons, painting, sculpting, poetry or music was the product of innate ability, but also to me, it was the product of a socialist moment with free quality education that allowed him access so he met my mum through journalism and actually um, she was the first woman in her family to get a degree and journalism allowed them to, to travel for work and led to me being born in the Emirates and, and growing up mostly here in, uh, in England, which has produced arguably a much more unstable relationship to place. But I was really grateful to be able to start articulating the complexity of the relationship um, although this work only brushes the surface in a lot of ways, I'm really grateful to present a migration story with some nuance. Okay. Um, after The Air is Subtle, Various and Sweet, I made a work called The Heart Wants What the Heart Wants. And initially this work was gonna be a, a live performance for an annual event called Art Night which was supposed to take place in 2020 around the Strand in central London. And I did site visit, settling on this space. Um, then COVID happened and the event was postponed. Then it went online. Uh, so the work became a performance for camera video uh, for the online iteration of Art Night 2021. And also it, screen it streamed uh, on, a, on a streaming service called Shersha as part of the Berlin-based Sura Film Festival, both of which focus on the work of filmmakers from North Africa and Southwest Asia. And this work, I guess it extended, uh, deepened, and to some degree began to interrogate the concerns of, of, of previous works. So I'd like to just show you um, that work. The Heart Wants What the Heart Wants was also shot on the Wanstead Flats, approaching thinking about marginalized communities that I belong to and some of the communities that I live alongside but don't belong to. But this time, focusing very much on my experiences of the intersection of race as a migrant and gender as 
a somewhat gender non-conforming person drawing more directly on Arab and Egyptian practices, languages and plants. And in a way, it was a development of the, of the thinking that produced Skin Flick. And two years later featured the return of the monstrous narrator with me delivering sections of monologue on screen in, in prosthetic makeup. And for me, this was a way of oversharing by speaking through and about characters. I was really forthright in, uh, in scripting this video. I drew on some really personal experiences and family histories and I felt quite ill at ease with the shape of the story. You know, I felt really exposed uh, and a bit self-obsessed in the number of times I said, I this or I that. So I took the script to a very good friend and artist, uh, Safi Al Maria, and they reminded me of the seminal queer novel, Fox and Their Friends Between Revolutions. And the way that so many of the characters were much like in the radical fairy community, named after animals and plants and flowers, and they reminded me of how many stories of herbs, flowers, and non-human actors were in the video and showed me how moving from first person to the third person could make enough space for me to talk about delicate subjects. So I became chamomile and cesspin and dragonwort and blue lotus. And though I don't make it explicit in the video, these are all flowers and herbs uh, that were used in ancient Egyptian funerary rites, some native and uh, some migrant through trade with Asia Minor, which is the contemporary Levant, Palestine, uh, southern Turkey, uh, extending this spectre of mourning, of loss and of grief from previous works. And this image of migration or, or, or the figure of the migrant overlaps in interesting ways with ideas and images of purity and by extension toxicity and, and, and with that uh, what belongs where and why you know this, this line of questioning has really been quite useful for me to unpick the ways and the reasons we name and we codify um, I guess to further destabilize because honestly I'm not afforded stability Um, I'm just going to share another video. So toxicity is an interesting word. Um, I feel like it was very present in my show at Nuraratnam Gallery where I presented a sculptural iteration of the era subtle, various and sweet. And I tried to draw on my dad's position in relation to material, uh, to collecting, to bricolage and to assemblage. You know, he was someone that, I guess, collected garbage and ephemera that had evidence of usage of the human hand. And for him, this made things valuable. Uh, his approach to collecting stuff detritus, uh, a seven up bottle from the seventies, his mother's metal laundry basin that he painted on, somehow shifts and complexifies how I think about waste and pollution. Uh, Nisha Ramaya wrote or really edited a text in response to my work, which was influenced and informed by her writing. And she read it to preface a conversation I had with the Serpentine curator Kostas Tazenopoulos at the Whitechapel for the German Award, which I was shortlisted for in 2021. Misha read, begin with Kamala, lotus flower, the 10th Mahavidya, hail Lakshmi, the good sign, Gaja Lakshmi, elephantine fortune, Amurta, one who is not dead, nectar, residue of the sacrifice. She is the antidote to poison. She is the poison itself. She is the poison. State-sanctioned documents. Honorific prefix. Holding a lotus, she rose to the top. She is the poison. Foaming progress. Betray, profane. Rosy or safflower dominion. She is the poison. Four white elephants conferring immortality. Produced at the churning of the ocean. This is not where I want to begin.
the the dissonance of invoking Hindu symbolism as a Muslim during Modi's rule isn't lost on me, but it's in the dissonance that I locate the reason for finding these images, these figures and symbols so intoxicating. Um, we have the thing and its representation existing in the same space. And that, just, I guess to some degree, Nisha and I share this way of articulating the diasporic experience through complexity, uh, through complex configurations of images and sensations, and that there, in a way, we find some community. Um, I get excited looking at how we become tangled up in each other's uh, lives, and there's this feeling that Toxicities may be relative to infection, you know, to an unwelcome closeness, to a breach of the skin, uh, of borders, of boundaries. And that's interesting to me, um, that there can be a relationship or an overlap between the biological and the cultural in so much mess and without resolution. Um, a couple of years ago, I made friends with someone who taught me about the ferment about fermentation processes, uh, about the microbiome on the skin and in the gut, and how eating fermented foods can be so beneficial to maintaining healthy gut flora. We talked about how so much of our bodies are made up of bacteria, you know, of, of non-human DNA, and and somehow, apart from being kind of gross, um, this really loosened or undid some of my ideas about my body ending at the skin and, and showed me that maybe we do in fact extend out into the environments that we live in and, and that we comprise each other in some ways. But there's a threat of disease here, of, of rot and decay. And these ideas, images and logics of dirtiness and threats are qualities that are ascribed both to the figure of the migrants uh, the homosexual and actually all female or femme identifying bodies. Um, toxicity and toxic embodiment have become really important to me. You know, after so many years thinking about touch and how mediating images of the body might affect how I think about or understand touch and embodiment, toxic embodiment as a field of inquiry adds existential concerns around health and, and the environment to this more established philosophical thinking around embodied experience and phenomenology. So the relationship between an actual experience and its representation in either language or image, which is really useful when you're trying to articulate any experience lived through the climate collapse where it's become so vital to reassess how we inhabit, live with, deal with our environment and with the other species that we cohabit with. Um, you know, how we actively cope with and try to stave off climate collapse. But also, and this stems from the thinking of Katriona Sandilens, Maro Helel and the Strida Nimanis, how looking closely at other species can affect how I understand my own body and how so often the language around classification and taxonomy, whether say a plant is ornamental or a weed, native or invasive, this language, it's used to describe people and communities also. Um, and this has resulted in fundamentally wrong and materially damaging and violent practices and policies from section eight to the current incredibly messy and willfully cruel uh, nationality and borders bill, which affects the, the resettlement of those fleeing war and traveling to Europe as refugees, particularly when we see the stark difference in response, both socially and in government rhetoric, if not in action, to refugees traveling within Europe and the Room for Refugees initiative. Um, I'm just gonna share another video. Um, 
I explored this issue in a recent video called A Proposal for a Parakeet's Garden, which was exhibited at Goldsmith CCA in London in a group show called Testament, uh, where I described the story of the migration of the London parakeet, uh, the introduction of the species to the UK as a coveted exotic pet in Victorian England via colonial trade routes from India and West Africa, and how a century later, it started to establish itself in the wild, becoming naturalized, but still vilified by fruit farmers as feral and invasive. Um, as a way to open up conversation around attitudes to migration more generally, not necessarily as a way to conflate the experiences of people and birds, but rather to ask the question, what's at stake here? And also through the sale of a print to generate some financial support for refugee charities, including the Lewisham Refugee and Migrant Network, as a way for the show to spread out and affect the communities local to the gallery in South London. Because I think it's important for political support from the arts to be material and not just a gesture. So, I guess to sum up, um, in a lot of ways, my thinking about toxicity, about poison and pollution is as much about accepting that we're living through critically relating to and historically positioning the climate crisis as relative to capitalism and colonialism and so to white supremacy as it is trying to tell these personal stories as a way to open up these larger conversations on how we treat each other. Thanks very much for listening. If anyone wants to ask questions, we can do that. Thank you, Adam. Um, that was really fascinating, fascinating talk. I, I put it back on kind of the group gallery view so that um, we could see everybody. And um, if you, have a chat, uh, a question, if you wanna um, put it in the chat. Um, I know that there were a lot of comments while you were talking about the reading list. I don't know if you wanted, if anybody had any particular uh, uh, specific requests or comments about that that they wanted to add. And if you um, raise your hand, I can unmute you. Have a look at these chat comments. I, I was also uh, wondering as well, um, you know, because your work is is you know it's very political, it's philosophical. If if maybe you could talk a little bit in how you go from you know these personal ideas and this theory into the actual pieces and maybe talk a little bit about your process for realizing the work um in a lot of ways most of the works that i've made start with a personal experience often they can be quite anecdotal not always pleasant but you know chatty conversational um and i'm someone who reads as a way to process things so when I'm writing I, I end up um, using and paraphrasing uh, ideas and expressions that I found useful you know when I found language for an experience that I couldn't quite articulate before that and that's why the reading list got really extensive I used to say when I first graduated art school I used to say I don't privilege text over lived experience and now I'm I'm finally in my dotage finding the reason to, to read um more theoretical writing <laughs> I guess because I found some of the writers that I, you know that I find useful and that speak to me on a, in, a, in a personal way could you we, we have I guess that's I guess that's a that's that's me <laughs> describing like a uh my thought process when I'm making, it's not the practical part of it, which is much, much drier and more bureaucratic. 
could you, um, we, we have a lot of undergraduate students and, and some of them might not be familiar with some of the works that you mentioned. Do you have any, you know, for, for emerging artists, um, like the go-to, the definite things that they should be reading that you would want to suggest? Um, Just important to you? I, I can talk about the, the books. I can go over the books that I talked about that, that were useful to me. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like everybody's reading list is a, is a bit different. Sorry, I just see. Has somebody mentioned the queer ecologies reading list? That's what I was trying to take notes on. And... <clears throat> okay, um, so let's think. So uh, Catriona Sandilands uh, gave a talk called Botanically Queer, which I found very useful. Um, she has a lot of writing and a lot of books that she's edited uh, around ideas of queer ecologies, which are, which are really useful. Um, hold on, I'll write, I'll write their name in the chat. That's one. Uh, Astrida Nimanis, another one. Um, for, for the work that I was talking about, I liked uh, composting feminisms, but uh, there's also quite a lot of work around water and liquidity, which is really, really fascinating and, and helped me through some more recent performance work. Um, the Jack Halberstam, mm -hmm. um, his book on wildness that came out about a year and a half ago is something that I, I poured over. Um, Oh, uh, who else I talked about? Kind of putting you on the spot here. <laughs> uh, I talked about um, Marwa Helel and one of my favorites, Nisha Amaya. Okay. So is I hope, oops, someone's got in there. There's a comment. So, from yeah, Plato. those 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 are the ones that I was talking about in there. There's a comment from Slinko. Do you want me to unmute you? I'm going to unmute you. Well, if you want. Sure. Um, this was not really a question, but I was reading something that I thought uh, Adam would be really interested in, so I can like email to you the full text. But there was this proposition from a mycologist. Um, that if we had based all our bio models have the way we see the world on like mushrooms essentially that we wouldn't have such divisions because mycelium lives on the ground and is connected through entire eco ecological system <laughs> so when you were talking about the porosity it kind of made me think about that and how these scientific divisions also overlap with social and political divisions. I, I was definitely looking at, at mycologists when I was making skin flick, 100%, <laughs> you picked up on that, like, thank you. I, but I, was, I wasn't looking at Tim Ingold, I, I was maybe a little bit more obvious because I was looking at Paul Stammer and also Anna Singh, um, the mushroom. Yeah, yeah, they were they, they also just come mentioned. Out in time. So they, they were like fresh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this, this text that I just pasted, like a very long quote from, is actually on Tim Gold's overlap between anthropology and art, and how he feels like the science has given up on everything that used to be um, poetic and kind of like ambiguous that were in pursuit and became these pure numbers. And he actually makes a a claim that artists are better scientists now, <laughs> especially as, as ecological um, agents. So I was wondering if you think that artists are better ecological science in a way, scientists in a way. Not really. No. <laughs> Do you? No, do you I think? don't. I don't, but I found it surprising to, to read that because I guess I believe in this very rigid data-centered um, methods of science. I trusted them. And now, like, if the scientist turns back and says, no, 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 that's bad, you should be more poetic. <laughs> um, that kind of introduced, you, you actually had in your lecture, 
the uncertainty, the uncertainty of certain systems and heritage. And that uncertainty is a very political, um, not even a gesture, it's like deconstruct, right? So you basically have to decide for yourself at every moment. And that's kind of scary for a lot of people. It is scary. It's also a privilege that that space to to make decisions for yourself and to to be allowed to be uncertain and to allow to present in ways that even you're not completely sure about and still be safe. It's a you know it's a it's a it's a big ask I think. Um, I'm not comfortable with data sets and numbers. I can barely count to ten, so. I, 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 part of what you said that Tim Ingold said, it, 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 it gives me a sense of someone who's not dealing well in their field and is trying to find a, an escape route. <laughs> you know, like it, like a, like it, maybe, maybe funding models don't work for scientists or something. And he's trying to say, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me. Any other thoughts or comments? Any questions? Um, yeah, I think I agree with you, MMM. I think they do need to, uh, to work together in some ways. Because, you know, we don't live in 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 binary data set situations, so this is so strange because this part of it is so conversational, and I'm just talking into a void. Yes, it's the the excitement of the Zoom conversation with um, 132 guests. <laughs> no, but I do I do agree with you, MMM. I. I I, uh, I think here I yeah. could I can work together. Can you unmute now? Yeah, great. Can you hear me? Yeah, I prefer to talk too because it's more um, fluid. Like I can't type as well as I can speak. Um, I used to work for NASA as a photographer for 11 years, and I can say that they do need to work with artists more. Um, and that personally, I feel like STEM or like all these other um, fields are, they're forgetting the A, you know, they're forgetting STEAM and they're certainly not, it seems like an afterthought. And I, I, from my trans poet community, I see a lot of agility and translation and fluidity, fluidity with consciousness and words in ways that I personally have grown from. Uh, it sounds similar to your experience with queer uh, mycologies as well. And I think that um, if we're not getting the people that are making decisions at the top to understand that they're making like, I mean, I feel like now we're back in where like Artemis just launched and it's still completely out of touch with like some sort of global like community. Sorry, I don't know what, it's Artemis a, is. what is Artemis? Artemis is the launch. It's we're going like it's the United States um, mission back to the moon and Mars. And so we just had a launch this week. So I'm like all riled up because I'm, I make art about the social inequities of the space program, specifically looking at the history forward. That's like my that's my project. Space race unclassified is the project that I'm working on and exhibiting. Um, now, now I'm not I'm not as successful as you. I'm I'm exhibiting in Chicago and um, New Mexico and other places in the states. But um, you know, from my personal experience, I think it's important to speak from something that you know in depth, and that's why I really love I really loved your work because it was so. You both spoke from the heart and from your personal experience, and also you did like such a great in depth view into what it means to be, you know, in your body, but also. Um, the imaginary, you know, not just looking at um, the expectations, um, looking at the phenomenal, um, and not just um, the beautiful sublime, like we think about just the, the kind of um, 
extraordinary. I love that you got sticky with it. You know, <laughs> like that's just, I really appreciate that so much. Um, I loved your dancers too. I feel like I want to know who they are. <laughs> I want to see them. Yeah, I want to see incredible <laughs> artists in their own right. They're practicing, I mean, the, um, collaborating with them is really important work to me. Um, yeah, I, I don't tend to work with people I don't know. Like their, their practices are really, really incredible. But to answer the question of whether or not artists, you know, Hito Styral, and I might be pronouncing her name incorrectly, I apologize if I am, but she was the MIT um, keynote speaker and a lot of her current work um, is rewriting over eugenic science work at Stanford. So she's like using the, 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 um, the strength of her solo practice to actually overwrite um, like Nazi history in, in biology so i think there is an opportunity um for artists that's, to... that's that speaks to how i think about things i mean where where culture becomes useful is in the application of uh you know the interpretation of um of, of data that's collected you know like if an abstract is being used to make decisions about people's lives their lived experience what opportunities are open to them how they can move through the world, how they can access resources or, or, or what rights they have, then yeah, <laughs> you know, if we can be useful as artists in that way, then yeah, definitely, let's do that. Well, maybe we should wrap up because I know that it's very late where you both are. And now it's probably yeah. going on 1.30. It's late and I'm, I just want to say thank you for bearing with me because I, I got a little bit in some of, in some points in the talk. So um, thank you for being patient with me. Well, thank you so much for, for joining the speaker series. And it's really wonderful to really understand more of all the ideas and personal experience where the work is coming from. Um, so, you know, taking the time to do this so late at, in the evening as well, after you're probably still a little jet lagged from being back in the U.S. Um, so maybe I just want to say thank you again for having me in Buffalo. Really, truly, I had such a, uh, an incredible experience at the school and meeting the students and, and you guys really, really were fantastic. So thank you for being generous with me.